Welcome to my crash course on Bash. This is not a complete course. I am currently working on a complete course in Bash for hackers that is going to be really comprehensive and more focused on if you want to learn how to become a Bash programmer or how Bash programming works if you were to work in a company and you needed to know the Bash language. This course is specifically for those who want to be able to modify exploits and be able to be an effective penetration tester or ethical hacker and know the Bash language well enough that you can modify modify exploits and maybe even write some of your own scripts so that you can accomplish all your purposes in the bash world. I know that is hard to believe you can do in the short span of 45 minutes, but that is the goal of this course. So if you are interested in the more advanced course, it is coming and you are welcome to subscribe and wait for that course to come out. But in the meantime, enjoy this one. All right. Welcome to our bash scripting course. We're going to start off with the download of visual studio code. A lot of people like to just write bash scripts inside nano or G edit or Vim but I don't think that's very useful for you as a beginner because we're going to use a few plugins that we can install on Visual Studio Code. So you can go right here to the link right here, which is in the description, and you can click this download right here, and you can click it, and then you can click download. If it doesn't go, then you will save and say, okay, I have already installed it, so I'm not going to download it again. It will look like this when it's downloaded into your downloads okay and then the command that you will need to insert into your terminal is this one right here so you will be in your home directory so you will cd over to your downloads you will ls and you will see this right here you will type this into your terminal right here and then hit enter and it will install this might take up to about 30 seconds but i have already installed it so i'm not going to run this right here again and just for reference, if this is not the exact same file that you have, you can just type in sudo apt install, and then you can type in dots, your dot slash, and then just start to type in code like this, and then hit tab, and it will auto-complete that for you so you don't have to go through and type in all of these numbers in. So once that is done installing, you can come over to your the drop-down, and type in Visual Studio Code and it will be right here and you will launch this and this is where we're going to be writing our code. Now some of the plugins we're going to be installing is shell code and you can come over to your little bar right here and you will click this one right here and you're going to search and we're going to search for shell check just like this and install this top one, you can click it. I already have it installed. You'll be able to click install just like this right here. Then we're going to use shell dash format just like this. It'll look like this and you will click install. Then we're gonna want shell man and it is right here and you will install. And then we want bash debug just like this. You can click on that and click install. And now our text editor is up and going and it is ready for us to open up a file and get started. So now what we're gonna do is make a folder on our desktop. We can come back to our terminal and type in CD, CD, desktop. And now we can make a directory and we'll just call this bash. And then actually we're gonna name that something else. So we'll move bash and we'll call it bash scripts and now if we ls we have bash scripts right here and we can cd into bash scripts and then we can touch and we'll call this file.sh and we're going to name a bunch of different files as we go through and write programs this is just to get us started so now we'll open our folder we'll go to desktops we'll go to our desktop bash scripts and then we'll open up we'll want to open up the whole folder and it will have our bash file in here now in order to get this started we'll just type in bash and hit enter and it's going to give us our shebang up here without going into too much detail here what we're going to do instead of running the default that our plugin uses for us is we're just going to run a bin bash and you're going to see this a lot and i don't want to confuse you so we're just going to run bin bash and if you want to, you can go read about why we would run bin bash instead of um, user bin envy bash. And so this is how we're going to run this. 
And then just to make sure everything is working, we can type in echo and then say hello world. And then we'll hit command save. And after we type in hello world, we'll come down to our terminal and this should be in our bash scripts. You can LS and it'll tell us we have our file right here. You can type in bash file.sh and it prints hello world for us so we know everything is up and going and ready. All right, now that we know we have everything working, let's go ahead and cover a few things that we have typed in here. So when we see this right here, the this is the hash and the exclamation point, which can also be considered as a hash and a bang, which is where the shebang comes from. And this tells the Linux machine when it runs this file, it's going to be running it as a bash command. So that's why when we come in here and we type in bash and then we run this bash with this file, it's going to execute everything after this as bash. And so then we have this echo, which it, if you're familiar with Python, it looks like we would run a print statement like this and then we would put our text in here and then we would say hello world. So the echo is the same as the print in Python. And so when we run this, that's why we have this hello world printed out at the bottom. Now, there's a couple other things I want to cover just to help you as you go along and you make notes. Sometimes we'll write scripts and you might not remember, okay, what is the echo command? You can make what's called a comment. On a Mac, you can press control and then the question mark or the slash, and then you can type anything in here. And this is commented out so it won't show up in the file so we can say echo will print the text and then when we come down here when we save it and now if we run it it'll say hello world and this does not get printed no matter how many of these we have in here or on however many lines it won't it will not make a difference. So when we run this, this is all commented out. So now that we have a basic understanding of what's on the screen, we're gonna move on. The first place to start is with variables. Variables store data and it can look like this. So we're gonna name it just var because it is simple for us to understand that it is a variable and then they will go inside of quotations because it's gonna represent a string and you can put your name in there. So if I put in Ryan, you can think of the variable as holding my name Ryan. So if I decided to echo and I wanted to not echo an array, and I wanted to echo out the variable. We put the dollar sign just like this, and then we type in var. And if I wanted to say hello like this, and then var, and I need a new terminal, which is right here. And we can come down here and we can just say bash file.sh and it says hello Ryan. So this seems really simple, but you will need to grab variables. They are super important and we will be using them all the time in the programming world. So right now, as you look at this, you think this seems very silly. Why wouldn't I just go like this? That seems like an awful lot of work. Why wouldn't I just type in Ryan? And the reason for that is because you may need to take an input at some point later on. We will do this. But for now, we're just gonna type it in here. We could just put in an IP address. So we could say IP address right here. I'm not going to put a real IP address in there just for the sake of this video. And down here you can type in in map and then you can say dash a dash p dash. And then now where we would normally put the IP address, you can just type var and then we'd put a dash v for, for verbose. And now if we save this and run it, we would get the variable would be the IP address. So if we had an IP address in here of 10, 10, 10, 10, and we ran this right here, it's gonna start scanning this for us. And you can see that scan started. So variables are really important because later we could make a complete recon tool. We could ask the user when they run the file, what IP address would you like to scan? And we would put in this and then our variable, whatever the user puts in, would be stored and our in map would run. So that's an example of how we would use a variable in the world of hacking. You will see this all the time in exploits when you grab them off of exploit DP. They'll ask for input 
inputs which will be stored in variables and maybe in the future you will need to modify them. So that is a variable, a very simple version of a variable. Okay, so one of the reasons I struggle with bash so much is because the way they name their functions, for example, in Python, if we made a name, and let's say we had an input and somebody input their name like this, if we wanted this to just be all caps, we would just put dot upper at the end of our function call or dot lower. But in bash, we do it a little different. I notice this is supposed to say name. If we echo this and we say echo, dollar sign, parentheses, and we say name, and then we don't forget to save it, and we run this, we get my name output here. But if we wanted to get just the first letter, letter capitalized, we would put in a caret, and then we have to save it. And now when we run it, my bad, we need a double caret. I forgot to save it. Now when we run it, we get all caps, just like this. And then if we wanted all lowercase, we just put in two, peer, two commas, and we can save it and run it, and now we get all lower. So in the world of bash, when you need to do something, if we don't cover it in this class, you may have to Google just to see exactly how to run this. But this is really helpful because a lot of bash commands and a lot of bash scripting is going to require all lowercase or all uppercase. So for example, a lot of times when you run against an active directory name, let's say you have the active directory name a lot of times they will be in all caps and you can use the double up caret just like this if you're running a script against it and you don't want to type it and you get all caps so that's an example of when you would want to use something like this in the world of hacking and there's a couple other things that might be useful for you that you can do if we wanted to, we could come in here and we can put in the an exclamation or sorry, we can if you wanted to you come in here and put in a hashtag. We can save this and run it and we get the length of the output. And with this word count, we can use this later. Let's say if we have a list and we want to know how many items are in a list, we can use something like this to check what is going on within the inside. And lastly, there is something we're going to need to know in order to grab numbers, or in our case, we may want to grab something out of a out of a string, and we want like every third word is help would be beneficial to us to grab. If we have something instead of name, let's give this as num equals one two. Three actually we'll start at zero because bash all programming languages start at zero when they start counting so if we come down here and we echo and we say dollar sign our parentheses and then we say num we should get our number our string of numbers put out down here but if we wanted to grab numbers out of here we would do something like this it will be the variable right here. So we'll have the, var the variable and then the offset, meaning what, how many over would we like to start? And then we have the length, meaning at what number would we like to stop? So in here, we can say colon. And if we wanted to grab numbers one and two, you would say zero, one, two. So a lot of times you won't start at zero. So for example, we would say zero, one, two. So if we wanted to grab the two and the three, we would say something like this, zero, one, and then two. And then if we save this and we run our file, we get number two and three. But for the sake of this not being super confusing, we'll start with zero, one, two, three. But what you just have to remember, but you just have to remember in the world of programming, computers start at zero, and this is our number one. So one, two, three just like this or in this case it'd be zero one two three and if we got rid of this we would have to say zero one two three and so on so i hope that makes sense 
and you are able to grab numbers out of this string and maybe you can go ahead and try and practice with grabbing numbers. You can also do something like this. You have to have a space in order to run a negative offset. But let's say we wanted to go backward four and then we want to grab the next two afterward. We can save this and you can run something similar to this and you get a totally separate set of separate numbers and I do use this every now and then it's not super common and you might see it in the future so it is something worth noting and keeping it in your back pocket okay I want to show you that we can save commands inside of variables and then we're able to run them inside of our scripts this will be helpful in the future so you're probably familiar if we come down to our terminal and we type in PWD of seeing our present working directory. But we can save commands inside of scripts and then use them. So for example, we can say uh, directory equals, actually we can say current, we'll say curder for our current directory equals, and then we say dollar sign, and then we put our parentheses and we say a PWD. Now, if we come down here and we echo a variable and we say current directory, just like this, and we save this out, and then we run our script, we get our present working directory down here. So another example of this is if we say time and we said equals, and then we put in date inside of here, we could say echo, and then we want to echo a variable, but before that we could say the current time is, and this is gonna give us our time and date. And if we save this, and we now run our script, it tells us that we messed this up because we didn't write in the time right here, and we save that. Now we run it, it tells us the current time is Saturday, June 4th, at this time. So that's how we can save commands inside of variables. And this is going to be helpful in the future whenever we have to write specific scripts and use them with commands that are already within our Linux machine. So from here, we're going to move more into working with numbers and the numbers will matter when dealing with things like IP addresses or sometimes you may want to print a word list that you want to use as with a fuzzer that has numbers on the end of it and we're going to be covering this in the coming up section okay we're going to be covering some numbers and adding them together and using a sequence of numbers in order to grab a range of ip addresses or possibly even make a password list with numbers but with bash this is a little different than other programming languages so you can either take this whole block right here that we've already written and comment it out or you can just delete it like I'm going to if you want to you can save it and keep it as notes for later so within bash if we say something like other programming languages x equals 4 and then we say y equals 8 and then we echo and the thing about bash, when we want to add these together, it's going to require a little different syntax than you might think. So we use dollar sign, then we have double quotes, and then we would say dollar sign x plus dollar sign y. And now if we save this and we run it, we get 12 down here. And I believe within bash, you don't even actually have to have the dollar sign, so we'll give this a try right here, and it still gives us 12. And this works with, also we have minus, and you can run divide and other commands like this. So if we run division, we have zero, which is right, because eight doesn't go into four, and bash won't give us any decimals, and it won't give us any negative numbers, which is really interesting. So if we say y, minus x and we save this we now get four if you want to run something such as a calculator within bash you have to use bc but i'm not going to cover that for the sake of this course i would rather tell you just use a calculator because it's going to be a lot easier than using the command line to run some kind of math so 
This is how we would use variables and numbers within bash, but when it becomes useful for us is when we want to create a list of say numbers. So if we say echo month and then we put curly braces and then we say 1.12, when we run this command it should print month 1, month 2, month 3, and so we'll save it and I'll show you what this looks like. So we have the output like this. And this may seem like it's not very useful in the world of hacking, but let's say we have an IP address and we want to create a list to scan against in the future. And maybe we're creating some kind of tool that is going to take an input of an IP in the range. We could say we have a subnet of a 124. So we'd say 1.255 through one. 1 through 255, then we save this, and then we run it. We now have all of these IP addresses. I forgot to put a point right here. And now we'll save it, and we'll try this again. And now we have all of these IP addresses, and we have this list that has a complete range of IP addresses for our range. So this is a helpful way to know that we can append numbers to something preceding it. So this will be helpful in the future. I don't use it a whole lot, but it is helpful to know that it is available for us if we ever run into any kind of problem. Okay, I want to cover something called special parameters because it is something you're going to run into in the world of cybersecurity. So we'll clear this and we can comment this out. And the reason you're going to run into this is when you run some, a tool or some kind of exploit that requires input from the user, say us, whenever we want to run this, it'll ask for a IP address that we want to attack and a port to connect back on. You may see it say that you didn't enter everything required. And an example of this is if we say if, and then we go square bracket, square bracket, and then this right here is a special parameter. So this is going to tell us that we need right here two inputs from the user when they run the file. So we have this if and then it's going to be a then and then this will be tabbed over and we'll echo need more parameters and it'll tell us echo usage requires usage needs two and then we can give it an exit of one which means we have an error and then in then for bash instead of an if else or an if or an elif like python it uses an fi and we can run it like this so we should be able to now save this okay we should now be able to save this after putting in those spaces and it should run for us. So if we run this, it'll tell us you need more parameters. But if we run it and we say, um, let's just use one space two, these are going to be two inputs from us and we run it, it doesn't give us any issues. In fact, we could do a, we could have it print uh, script worked, but in this case, we'll just leave it. So that way you can see we didn't get any exit code. It needs two inputs from the user in order to execute. So with that, this looks really, really scary. But really what I wanted you to see was this is the special parameter that tells the file that we need, that, tell, that Bash will tell us that we need two inputs from the user in order to make this script actually run. So these are special parameters and they are going to be one of those things that if you want to memorize them, I would suggest, which I rarely ever suggest things like this, is flashcards and memorize. Usually when you're in the world of programming as well as cybersecurity, you would just say, I know there's a way to use a dollar sign in order to get to inputs from a user and I just need to know it and later when I run into this I can just come back and Google how to do this and read how to do it. It saves you a lot of headache and a lot of time memorizing because you're probably not going to use this very often you're, and will forget it. But it's, in, it's important to know that this exists because maybe in the future you will run into an exploit that has something like this but the exploit is old and maybe it has been deprecated within the 
version that we're running our exploit against and we need to get rid of one of the parameters you now know that you can come in and say instead of two let's say it had four and it has been deprecated and it no longer needs four inputs it only needs three you can come back and just put in three and now you can run the exploit as you need so this is the reason I would suggest trying to remember that this dollar sign hash does has a specific special parameter function because it is something you may run into in the future and need to know how to modify. We're going to ignore the if statement for now and we're going to look at a different way to take input from the user and that is with the read command. So you can just say something like this read and then we can say maybe we want an IP address and we want a port number. We'll just leave it at that for now. So we can go enter and then we could say something like echo. It is going to be with a variable. The variable is IP. Then we can come back here to the front, say something like the IP. We'll say that the target target IP is and then we'll have that IP and then we'll say echo with a, another that was with the text. That's OK. We can just add our variable in later. We can say the connection port is and then we'll go dollar sign curly braces accent two curly braces we will say the port and then close off our curly brace there now one thing that you're going to notice is why is our variable not lit up and the reason is because single quotes get rid of every special character inside of a string and double quotes will leave all variables alone so that is something to note for the future so now if we save this and we come down here and run our file it's going to leave a prompt and we could say the IP address is 10 10 10 10 and then the space puts us onto the second variable and we'd connect back on port 444 and then we hit enter and it tells us the target IP is this and then the connection port is this. Now there is a better way to do this and what we could do is something like this. We'll delete the port and we can put a dash P and this is going to give a prompt to the user and we'll say input the target IP colon space we'll add a space in here and now we could say read dash P and then we can do the same thing and say input the connection port colon space and then we can come in here and put in port now if we save this and we run it again we have an a prompt down here and then we hit enter and then it asks us for a connection port and we put in our connection port and then it prints out for us the target IP port or the target IP and the target port so this is how you take input I like this a lot better because it is user friendly and it's really simple for us to read what is going on and this way we cannot skip say an input and if we put in an empty input as our port then we would have an error with an if statement and we'll cover that in the coming section before we move into our if statements and loops we need to understand conditional statements or conditional operations so we We'll comment out this code right here. I hit the wrong button. We'll comment out this code right here. And we will see things like this. You'll see a dash EQ, which is going to be an equal to, or maybe we will see something like a dash NE, which is not equal to. You can see something like a dash GT, which is going to be a greater than. I'm going to go ahead and comment this out so it stops suggesting things to me. So we'll see a dash EQ, a dash NE, the, the dash GT, which is greater than, and then a dash LT, which is less than. 
or a dash GEQ, which is greater than or equal to, which is the one we probably will be using the most, and then a dash LEQ, which is less than or equal to. These will be really helpful when running our for loops. And so it is helpful to know. So let's give a look at these in action. So the way we would write this is if we wanted to give a statement, we'd put our brackets and there has to be a space in between the bracket and the first number. So we would say if two, and then we'd say dash EQ is equal to two, then we're going to have it do something and we would tell it to echo that the statement is true. And the way we would do this is by adding the colon and then say echo and then dollar sign and then question mark. And the reason we're using the dollar sign question mark is because it's going to return a Boolean. So a Boolean is something that is going to be true or false. So it's going to return true, which is going to be equal to zero. And if you're from another programming language, then you will know this is not normal for most other programming languages, but bash true is zero and false is going to be equal to one. So this is going to true this is going to return true or false in the form of a one or a zero. So when we run this, we'll save it and now when we run this we should return back a true statement. Two is equal to two, but if we change this to three and we save it, and we run it, we get a false. This is not true. So this equals right here only works with integers, which is which is numbers. It is really important to remember that it only works with numbers. So we can do something like this and we can say not equal to. So is three not equal to, tr to two? Delete this and it returns true. So we have this true given to us right here. When we run something like is three greater than two, and we'll save this, we can run it and we get a true, is it less than two, and we will get a false. This is really helpful when we run our for loops. In the future, you're going to, you will run into this, you're gonna see it, and is something to be aware of. Okay, we can also look at conditional operations for strings. An example of this would be, we'll uncomment this, would be something like this. So we'll use an equals and we'll say um, the word, word, word is equal to word. And now if we save it and we run this, we get it is false because I spelled it wrong, save, and we run it and we get a true. So this this equals is used for strings. And if we want to say a not equals, you put a bang in front of it or an exclamation point. And then if we save and run this, we will get a false because it says they're not equal, but they really are equal. So if we take off the end of this word, save it and we run they are not equal is true so this is helpful especially if you're running a script that you are looking for a specific keyword within a text that has been fed in through an input you can check to see if they are equal and then have it do something afterward so now we're going to move on into if statements and we're going to see how this plays into writing our if statements statement off of what we already have here. We'll just make this a word and we'll make this equal to. And then the way if statements work is you start an if statement with if, and you can also use an else, but when you're done with the if statement, you write in fee just like this. So we can do if this is true, then do this portion of code else if it's not true do this portion of code and then when the script hits fee it will exit so if we come in here and we just say if word equals word we're going to tell it then we want it to do something so we can come down here and say echo and we're going to use echo a text and we'll tell it to echo words match and then we can come down here and tell it else. We can do an else and we can tell it to echo a text and we'll tell it does not match. Just like this. I accidentally clicked the debug, but we're not gonna mess with that right now. And then we're going to 
close this off. Now, if we save this, come back to our terminal, and we run the file, it tells us the words match. If we get rid of our D again, and we save, and we run this, it says they do not match. So this is how you can use a comparison with an if, then, else, fee statement. So if it is this, then we want it to do a specific function, and if not, we, then we can have it do something else. This is a very basic if statement, so I would challenge you to change this if statement and see if you can do an if the number two is equal to the number two, then you want it to echo the numbers match, else they do not match, and then do the same thing with a not equals and just work your way through these and see if you can play around with the if statement and really grasp these concepts and make them your own. We're gonna be moving on to while loops and we're gonna cover these really quickly because we won't use these a whole lot, but an example of when a while loop is used is in a buffer overflow. When we want to crash a program, we're going to send it so many bytes until it crashes. And so the example is we're just going to say while this is running, we're going to send bytes to the server until it overflows. So while loops are used, but I use them very infrequently. I don't use them often. I know there are other programmers out there who love while loops and use them all the time. I would much rather use a for loop. So for that purpose, we're gonna cover while loops really quickly. So while we're in our file here, we're gonna write a while loop and we're gonna use a really common while loop that is used pretty much in teaching while loops no matter what the programming language is. So if we take an input from the user like this and we say enter a number and then we do our colon space and then we're going to assign it a variable of num just like this and then we say while the condition which is going to be the num is we'll say less than 10 we want to do something so down here it tells us we need to enter it and enter in what we want it to do. So we want to echo or call out the number for us every time the while loop runs. And then down here, we need to make sure that our number continues to go up. So we'll say num equals dollar sign. And down here, we will need two sets of parentheses. And we will say dollar sign num plus one and the reason we're adding in this plus here is each time the while loop runs we're going to add one to the number and so the first time the loop runs let's say we enter the number zero it will run through the while loop and then when it hits this line of code it'll be zero plus one the second time it runs through this loop of code it'll be one plus one which is two and then two plus one is three every time it runs it's changing this variable so what we are going to do is save this and run it we'll run it a couple of different times so you can see how this works so let's say we enter zero as our number i have an ls here and that is not it it is a less than which is an lt so we'll save this run it and our number is zero and it shows us it runs one two three four five six all the way down and remember that it starts here at one two three and here we go so it runs for us from zero all the way to 10. Now, if we run it again, and let's say we put in the number eight, it only runs twice because nine, when it hits 10, when the number equals 10, it is no longer less than 10. So now that we see how the while loop runs, we can also do something like this. If we enter in a number that is already greater than the number 10, it will just exit the code because it is no longer a less than. So this is an example of how a while loop runs over and over and over until the statement up here is no longer true. Now I would challenge you to use this with a greater than and maybe change this to a minus and see if you can use an input of a number and say that you need this to be as long as the number is greater than 10, you want it to do this and then you're going to minus one. And so you can kind of play around with a while loop and get an understanding of how it works. All right, I have typed out a for loop here for us, and this is a very basic for loop. So we have this for loop here in for, 
we have this for is how we're going to start it. I, which is going to be the variable, which iterates through the list that we give it. So we're saying for I in this list of numbers, we want it to do something and we want it to echo out the variable I every time this loop runs. So the first time the loop runs, I will equal one. The second time it runs, we'll put a two in here. The I will equal two. The third time it runs, it's going to equal three and so on. So if we save this, and we run this file, you can see I echoes out one, two, three, four, five, and so on. So every time we use something like this, and so this is the for loop, and you can play around with the for loop in a lot of different ways, and even use these to loop through lists or arrays in order to get it to print. But the point of this course is not for us to learn how to program with for loops, but rather understand them and know how to edit them as we go through our cybersecurity journey, remembering that the point of us being able to understand Bash is not to be Bash programmers, but in order for us to know how to manipulate Bash scripts that are already written, as well as Bash exploits. So when you see a for loop like this, you now know how you can edit it and change it. And if you need to, you can write simple bash for, script, for loops and loop through different arrays and lists.